Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. We'll give everybody a few minutes to join. Uh, I can see a few people flooding in. This is great. <clears throat> Shira, where are you? Are you on the I'm, East Coast? I'm on the East Coast, uh, New York, just north of New York City. All right. Um, today, I'm in Long Beach, California. So I spend about half my time in Buffalo and then um, a quarter of my time traveling and working with customers and a quarter of my time in Long Beach. Nice. Yeah, it's a good mix. Beautiful. It's a good mix. And it's beautiful. Uh, it's starting to get warmer in Buffalo. So that's that's also nice. That's cool. That is great. awesome. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick introduction. And then Shira, um, you're going to take it away. We're so glad to have you. But um, today our webinar is with Cheryl Leibowitz. Um, I'll get through her introduction in a moment. But this one is called Thriving Through Challenge. Uh, and even when full-on crisis happens uh, in our world of early education. So um, welcome, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Scott Wayman. I'm the founder and CEO here at Kangaroo Time. Um, we are super excited to have Shira here, Dr. Shira Leibowitz. Um, she's the CEO of Discovery Village Child Care and Preschool. We'll get into that in just a moment, but real quick before we jump off into things, we like to always introduce Kangaroo Time. If you're new to our webinars, let me tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we create software for early education schools and child care centers and, and recently uh, for after school programs. Um, it's just been a, a rapid growth in, the, in that business. Um, we have a beautiful new platform that's designed to manage every aspect of the business. Um, we'd love for you to check it out and We'd like for you to go and visit kangarootime.com. Uh, it's it'll it'll give you all the information. While you're at it, go to kangaroo.com, go and subscribe to our blog. We have an embarrassment of wealth when it comes to content there. And Marissa and people like uh, Shira, uh, Evelyn Knight, uh, Prana Richardson. There are a number of thought leaders, um, one of them who we're privileged to have today, that contribute to our blog. Also, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, Marissa will share the, the link in the chat. Go to our, our YouTube channel and subscribe. We do this, we do this every other week, every couple of weeks, sometimes once a month. Um, and now we've started doing programming weekly in Australia. Uh, and it's just good for the heart and it's good for the soul good for the mind um these hearing thought leaders like shira um having access to this content we always try to make it a little bit fun too uh and it's it's always quick snippets uh 45 minutes to an hour of great content on great relevant topics uh we're hosting our very own conference in buffalo new york this summer We'd like for you to join us. Uh, you can go to, uh, the website is bounceconference.com. Go to bounceconference.com and register. We are almost at capacity, but we would love to have you there. Please, please, please jump on and sign up and join us in wonderful Buffalo, New York, uh, July 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, we have two full days of programming set up with a welcome reception set up for Wednesday, July 20th. And this is an opportunity for us to just come together, um, talk about best practices for kangaroo time to continue its advocacy for the early educator and the early education entrepreneur. Uh, we, wanna, we want you to come and celebrate uh, just what so far has been a fantastic year uh, for all of us, a trying, um, but but a, a year of rejuvenation and, and really kind of resetting. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. You will get certificates. So the day after each of these webinars, if you are here, um, we, we take attendance and then we have uh, something that sends out all your certificates. On that email, it also has the link to the YouTube video 
So if you loved it and you want to share it, please do. And then go and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Once again, I can't ask you to do that too many times. If you have questions for those of you that are, that are seeking questions, I think Shira and I have done this a number of times. It's great if you pop things into the chat, like affirmations and you go girls. Um, but uh, there's a formal Q&A button on the Zoom control. So hit that Q&A, pop in a question. If there's something that um, Marissa and I can answer in the background, we will. Um, if not, we'll have it uh, waiting for Shira in the Q&A session uh, at the end of when she presents her content. Microphone and cameras, they are off. We can't see you, we can't hear you. Uh, and again, we will send the recording out later today or, or, or sometime tomorrow. Um, but but don't, don't send us an email until the end of the day tomorrow. You will get it, I promise. All right, so about Shira. Uh, Shira is the CEO and founder of both Revabilities and Discovery Village Revabilities, and is a it's a professional learning academy that helps business owners bring their vision for learning to life. Discovery Village is a play-based childcare center and preschool located in Tarrington, New York. Shira is also co-author of Coach, uh, the Coach Approach to School Leadership leading teachers to higher levels of effectiveness. And I think this book is brand new and it's about to, it's about to be available for consumption and Cheryl will, will clarify all that in just a moment. Um, her, I, sorry, th that book's available. Her upcoming book, Havens of Hopes, Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 Pandemic. It will be published sometime this summer. Cheryl will let you know how to get the ones she's already published and this one that's coming up. Uh, we're super excited about it and I'm ready to read it. Uh, today's discussion, Cheryl will discuss how to thrive through challenges in the ECE world. As an experienced ECE leader, Cheryl faced these challenges firsthand. We're looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us, Shira. And actually, Shira, when we really started chatting, when we really got to know each other, I remember, um, we were all struggling to understand guidance around the PPP loans. And uh, we, you were a huge part of our community at KT Child Care Connect, which is a Facebook group. Uh, Marissa will share the link. First of all, thank you for taking that tragic time and, and helping us with your learning, um, but welcome and I will step aside. Thank you so much and welcome all. So your cameras are off and your audio is off. So I can't see you or hear you, but I can read the chat. And I'd like this to be as interactive as it possibly can. So in addition to popping questions in, into the chat, pop in answers. We have all been through world changing crisis and it's impacted us. And I want to give us an opportunity to process a little bit and to reflect on how we can not only continue, continue to navigate through, which we have, but to really thrive. And I'm gonna begin with a question for you, which is, um, what is beauty to you? If you'd like, you can reflect on it. If you'd like, you can pop your answer in the chat. But I, throughout these challenging times, continuing challenging times with our staffing crisis, with inflation, with uh, continuing cases of COVID and, and quarantines, I've thought a lot about beauty and finding beauty. So um, Tracy is answering something that makes me feel happy or peaceful, and that is beautiful and so core to what has driven me through these past few years. Um, Scott, beauty is when I get a tickle in my soul. Yes, we can feel it emotionally in the gut of our being. And sometimes the most beauty comes from the greatest struggle. And I want to share with you a quote that has long moved me 
and that came to mind as I was preparing this presentation. Um, and it's from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is a psychiatrist who became very well known for her work on grieving and death at a time um, before people were talking much about death and dying. The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. And you, my ECE friends and colleagues, are beautiful people and you have just not happened. And you and your schools, we and our schools have become so much more beautiful through these challenging times. And it's, it's not always evident. Um, we see two narratives in the field. I noticed this from the very beginning of the pandemic and sadly it's, it's still as powerful for me today as it, as it was back in, in March and April of 2020. One is a narrative and the, the words that come out of these narratives um, I, I hear resonating within them, Dr. Kubler-Ross's quote. One narrative is that we're broken. How many times do we hear literally said in the field, early childhood is broken? And that's a narrative of defeat, of suffering, of struggle, of loss. And there is defeat, there is suffering, there is struggle, there is loss, there is pain. All of that is true. And there's political reason that we talk about being broken to get the support that children and families deserve. But we're not broken. We're strong, we're resilient, we're powerful. The second narrative is that we're redesigning. And that's the positive piece of that same coin. We have appreciation, sensitivity, understanding, compassionate gentleness, and deep loving concern. We are becoming ever more beautiful. And that narrative we can grasp onto and pursue and chase with zest and vitality. And so don't hesitate to pop into the chat ways that you feel yourself a different person in a positive way or um, a truer, more authentic version of yourself than you were two and a half, three years ago. We all are. We've been changed through the experiences we've gone through and continue to go through. And when pandemic hit, um, we changed literally overnight. We did. And we did it well. And as all of that was happening, um, I set out to document it. So part of my practice in my school and many of your practices may be to document learning and to document experience. And I wanted to document our learning as educators and our experience and that those stories that that documentation will be published uh, officially in the summer. Uh, the book will be available Havens of Hope on Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble all over. There is a limited run that will be available by next month directly from Red Leaf. The story traces 25 different programs, early childhood programs that stayed open as essential, including mine early childhood programs that moved outside, early childhood programs that went remote for a while, which seemed like the most ridiculous thing when I first did it for those who weren't coming in, although I was open. And somehow we did it. K to 12 programs, public, private, charter, uh, alternative community programs, pods that became micro schools and community programs that, that rose to support people um, when the schools were shut down or going remote. So um, the crisis that we see comes in, in three different pathways. And this isn't just now, this is always. There's crisis outside of our program. And we've recently been experiences that, experiencing that in massive ways, pandemic and now staffing shortages, inflation and rising costs, UPK programs coming in and a partnership between 
public and independent that, that can be very fruitful and can be very challenging. Pro challenges inside our programs, and I'm going to talk to you about this, and I'm going to talk to you in a very real vulnerable way about a recent crisis my own center faced, injuries, regulatory violations, facility issues, situations that face a particular center, and our personal lives and the personal lives of those in our schools, which are also crises happening all the time. Now, there, there are two kinds of crises, acute or chronic. An acute crisis, somebody's hurt, you need to tend to them immediately, you need to call 911. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about chronic crises. And so when you have an acute crisis, something immediate, it's either solved quickly or it becomes chronic. So we're talking about those long-term crises that we navigate through over time. Um, and for chronic crises, the path I want to suggest to you is not figuring out how to get through it, get to the other side and have everything be better, but to live during, because life is full of adversity and we can find joy in the challenge, even when it's happening. We can live full, fulfilled, meaningful, happy lives, even while facing the crises. So one of the things that I learned in the interviewing folks for this book that I wrote was that crisis, in, in the case that I was talking about, COVID, but it can be any crisis really, can serve as a catalyst, it can serve as an accelerator, it can serve as an anchor, or it can serve as a sculptor. And I want to share a little bit about what that looks like. You're welcome to pop in the chat if you've experienced or, or experiencing any of this. So there were people I spoke to who COVID served as a catalyst. People who started schools never saw themselves as someone who would start a school, but saw a need and jumped in. There were folks for whom COVID was an accelerator. They were on a path. A lot of the outdoor educators saw this, believed in bringing education outside as one example among many. And COVID gave the impetus and the spark to move more quickly in that direction. For others, COVID and crisis can serve as an anchor, grounding them in what matters most. And for others, this big time was my case, although I experienced all of the four, was COVID was a sculptor. It forced us to really pull back the layers of what we offer, what we provide, kind of come to the essence of what matters most. And to go back to beauty, it was a beauty in that and a piece in that and really getting to the essence. And through that, I relied on values that had never been what I ever, ever would have considered core values. And so likely when you go through crisis, your core values won't be enough. And you need to dig into yourself. And it's almost like a chef with a, an array of ingredients. One ingredient may be the star, but the nuance of what spices, what supplementing ingredients come into play in this beautiful recipe make all the difference. And so that we had to look within ourselves and find qualities of character within ourselves that we may not have built up in the past. And that gave us the impetus to strengthen parts of ourselves that we had never paid necessarily so much attention to. So for me to be concrete and give an example, um, I had dug in deep before the pandemic to creativity, to discovery, to play. During the pandemic, that was important, but it wasn't enough. I needed also to ground into calm and to honesty and trustworthiness. And keeping a place of calm and of peace when the world outside felt chaotic became essential. And a focus, a core on well being for ourselves and for our world became what mattered it, it is far more than it had ever had before. So I wanna jump in and talk about crises in the world, crises that we experience in the world and we've experienced a lot of them recently and how we face them when they impact us directly. So it's not something that only we read in the news but it's something that's impacting 
on our world in serious, dramatic ways. And so I'm going to share with you an image, and I want you, I want to invite you to think about images in your own mind of what the pandemic looked like in your world. You can, you're welcome to jot into the chat uh, some in words what the pandemic looked like for you. For me, this is what the pandemic looked like. It was full of color and life and joy and hope and kids experiencing hope. And that doesn't mean that the hardship does, wasn't there. It doesn't mean the grief wasn't there. It doesn't mean the suffering wasn't there. But it means that we were able to, in our own small corners of the world, pull out beauty, pull out magic, care for those immediately in our world and make the experience of going through the traumatic times not feel quite so traumatic. Um, I want to move into staffing. Uh, put into the chat, just don't hesitate to put it to the chat if you're fully staffed. If you're not fully staffed, I would love to know. Uh, I am not fully staffed. So there are lots of really talented educators out there talking about how to get fully staffed. I have listened, I have read, I have tried every way, but none of those have worked for me. And I'll tell you what has worked for me, choosing to run a smaller program by choice. Now, what do I mean by small? Uh, I personally, I have a license capacity of 128. We currently have 83 students. We have a wait list of 200 and our, our enrollment is closed and opens gradually as we bring in more teachers. I have more teachers today than I had before the pandemic. I am well staffed for the students I have. We made the decision that we were gonna run with quality without overstressing the people we have, even if that means running a smaller program. And so what's happening as, as I understand it is almost like a game of musical chairs where the chairs are the uh, positions available and the seats are people to fill them. There's just not enough people working in early childhood to go around. And so we can use all the creative approaches and I've done all of them, uh, carrying my business card with me and giving it out in places when I receive good service, uh, giving stipends for people who will refer their friends, giving gifts to families who refer to people, spending tons of money on every recruitment service. And it's helped, but it's not enough. A um, bunch of people are writing in, this, in the um, chat, not fully staffed. That's what's going on. And there are people out there talking about how to get fully staffed. There are people out there talking about improve your culture and you'll be fully staffed. Uh, I haven't found that. I keep working on improving my culture. And to do that, I've had to intentionally slow down on hiring, not hire everyone who comes in through the door and create beauty with what I have. So Karina saying she's not fully staffed. Tracy saying she works with resource and referral and most of the programs are not fully staffed and struggled to hire. Just spoke to one earlier who said the same thing about reducing the number of enrolled children. Yeah, that's been, we've, we've reduced hours. So we don't close at six anymore. We close to five, which pains me because I, I wanna be open till six for working parents. But first comes beauty, first comes quality, first comes serving those we serve well. So we are facing challenges and Karina saying she's also reduced hours um, and reduced enrolled children. So this is a reality in our field. And I wanna say to you who are listening and not fully staffed, this is not because you don't run a good enough program. You run rock star programs, awesome programs. There are fewer people to fill those seats. And we can face that challenge with courage, with joy, with playfulness, and with quality for those we're serving, just as we did during the early hard days of pandemic. So this is what staffing shortage looks like to me. Um, we 
we don't onboard with videos. We onboard one-on-one. -on -one. This is a picture of my educational director, a new hire, a uh, very new hire. She started a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, spend long orientation with them, we show appreciation for our staff. I have currently, I think the best staff that I have had in the past 25 years I've been in this business, most of my time in the business was, was in K-5 to programs, um, but we're not fully staffed. We're not. And we're finding the way to find joy, to be relaxed about it. And so something that's been helpful to me is dropping the energy of fear. And so when I hire, when I interview, I don't feel I need to hire this person. I'm running okay as I am. And it took time to get there. And there were months where I personally was in the classrooms, uh, opening a toddler classroom, closing an infant classroom. And those things happen and they don't mean that we're not capable. So my biggest message is um, you are strong, you are good, you are quality, and you can continue to build on that quality while you're smaller as you grow. Um, crises in our own programs. And now I'm going to be super honest and super vulnerable about a recent challenge that I went through that changed my whole perspective on what violations, regulatory violations look like. So um, without revealing more confidences than I can, I had a situation where I um, I had to report a teacher to Child Protective Services. Child wasn't physically injured, child was emotionally fine, engaged with the child in a way that was um, minimally needed to fire. But uh, I checked in with my human resources consultant who told me, in fact, to call the police and to call Child Protective Services. It was about the way in which she showed affection to, us, to a child. Again, not abuse, child wasn't hurt. Um, but, but something was very, very wrong. We viewed this on the video, confronted her, escorted her out of the building and told her we would decide what would happen pending further investigation. I called my HR consultant. My HR consultant said to me, you witnessed a crime, call the police. I did. I then called my licensor who told me to call Child Protective Services. I called Child Protective Services. Now, to show that this is a little bit subtle and in our business, these things are hard. Child Protective initially didn't want to take the case. We insisted that the individual answering the phone got somebody else to confer. They did take the case. Um, I showed this was a teacher who was not performing as she should. We have, most of us have faced teachers not performing as they should and needing to fire and having that on video. I turned over that video to Child Protective Services to my licensor, and we had a slew of violations. Corrected them, uh, ended up firing two more people afterwards, and the culture rebounded and is stronger and better. Now, what did I do when I found that? I called the police and I called the child's parents. I brought them both in. I showed the child's parents the video of exactly what had happened. I sent an email to all my parents reporting to them what had happened. And what came out of that was a building up of greater trust in us. So if anyone looks at my violations record, it looks like a mess. And I have said to my faculty, I am proud of every single one of those violations because I didn't sweep something under the rug. I could have fired her and not reported it. Uh, my licensor wonders what happened at another center she had worked at. So I'm not sure if anybody else has faced a situation like this, uh, but you may have faced crises. And when you do, facing them head on, honestly, transparently, and boldly is the way to come through and the way to get better. And so through mandated trainings afterwards, um, our staff were able to connect more dive into themselves, find out how quickly things that don't seem like a big deal necessarily can become a big deal really fast in the work that we do and in our obligation to care for other people's children in a way that has integrity. 
So we're a better center as a result through that process. We also spoke to my um, licensor early in the pandemic. He wondered why it was that my center had more COVID than his other centers. Um, as it turns out, he now believes that I reported our cases of COVID more uh, quickly and fully than necessarily other programs did. So it wasn't more COVID, it was reporting of COVID. And so that that's changed my view, that experience has changed my view on what it means to be transparent, on what it means to face a crisis, on what it means to take it on, and what it means to run with quality, because you can be of the highest quality and challenges will hit you. Adversity will hit you. And it may have to do with ways that you could be better, a ways that you didn't do everything you needed to do. But as soon as you see it, address it, act on it. And that process of honestly taking on even the thorniest challenges um, helps us grow. It helps us grow. It makes us better. And these are my images of the days that I was dealing with the police and child protective services, what our classrooms looked like, what we were posting on social media. And parents remained happy, kids remained happy, teachers remained happy, and we came through with a reputation of not being a place that sweeps anything under the rug and that uh, pours love on these kids and cares for them no matter what it is that's happening for us, creates an environment of calm and play and joy, no matter what is happening behind the scenes for us. And we continue to focus and to work and to strive to get better at that. And finally, crises in our personal lives, they happen. Uh, I have faced numerous um, hospitalizations of myself, of close family members in the past year, all kinds of crises. Uh, that could have been serious, that could have been potentially life-threatening. Uh, my staff have as well. We've gone through a lot and we don't know everything our staff is going through. We only know what people choose to tell us, but being alert and attuned and a place that is as safe as possible also contributes to what, what's happening for our staff and how they function and what's happening for our kids and our families and how they function and being able to come to a place that gets them, that understands them, that embraces them in all of their beauty and all of their magnificence and all of their strengths and in all of their woundedness. And that's really, really a gift of what we are able to do in our work. So there's a focus on well-being. How do you navigate through crisis? You take good care of yourself. First and foremost, you accept that there's crisis, that there's hardship. You don't just wish for it to be over. How many times have I heard on social media or in conversations, educators saying, can we just go back to 2019? We can't. We've changed. The world has changed. And that can either be a positive thing or a negative thing. It could rise us up or it could pull us back. And we get to choose. We get to choose our response. We don't get to choose the circumstances that hit us, but we can always choose how we respond. And we can strive more and more as people who are always giving heart and soul and being to put our own well-being as a priority. And that has been a really positive outcome of these past crises for myself and the way I interact with my staff and my leadership team. So a shift I want to suggest is to move from readiness to life right now. You know, in ECE, some of us talk about kindergarten readiness. When I was in the K-5 to and K-8 to and K-12 to world, we talked about college and career readiness, still do. When we're always getting ready, we're missing what's magnificent right now. When we're always looking at our strategic plans, what's going to be when we're fully staffed? What's going to be when we build that new facility, that new playground, improve on whatever it is that we're working on improving? We live and breathe excellence and commitment and dedication right now. And paradoxically, when we do that, the future emerges in a much more powerful way than if 
we were constantly looking towards it instead of living right now. How we do anything is how we do everything. So how we face crisis is not only about how we face crisis. How we infuse our vision and our program is not only about our program. It's about how we face operations. It's about how we face culture. It's about how we talk about ourselves. The little things are the big things. And I want to share a story that hurt me deeply in a way that it wasn't intended to, uh, the way we, we take and transform things sometimes in our career that, that aren't what they were intended to be. So very early in my career, I was an assistant principal of a K to five. Principal was close to retirement, wise, experienced, and was a real mentor to me. And he was facing some serious self health issues. The following year, he, he did retire and I became the principal. But through these health issues, um, with some of the health issues related to his heart and his cardiologist had said, you can't get stressed. And he said, that's impossible. I'm a school principal, there's stress. Cardiologist said, it's your choice really. If you get stressed, you'll die sooner. So you decide. What I'd recommend, the cardiologist said, is when you are worried about something, stop and think, will I care about this or even remember it five years from now? And if the answer is no, let it go. And I took that in deeply to my core and I let things go, but too much because the little things are the big things. The little things are indicative of what matters. I don't mean to be super stressed. We're not. We focus in our program of, of being calm, of people walking in and saying it, it feels like a spa in here with the soft music playing and the essential oils blowing and this environment of calm, although there is messy creativity as well. So it's not being stressed, but it is tending to the small things so that they don't become big things. And so that we infuse who we are and what we believe in, in those micro interactions. When we do that and focus on those micro interactions, we find that we have much more control of the environments we're designing than we think we have. And we find much more capacity to be fully living and fully creating and fully offering quality even when dealing with incredible constraints. And moving to culture and people talking about culture, which although I do not believe the staffing crisis and people understaffed is related to lack of quality or lack of treating our staff well. Culture is like a garden. Culture is like a human body. It requires water. If not watered regularly, it'll wilt, it'll dehydrate, It'll die. But if given too much water, it's going to drown. You can't fire hose uh, a garden and you can't fire hose a person and you can't fire hose the goodwill on your faculty and on your students. It's this consistent nurturing in the right measure. And that's the path to not burning ourselves out, to measuring what we give, to having the time and the mental energy and space to tend to our well-being, well <clears throat> which is the way to thrive always and even during crisis. So I want to end, I began with a quote, I want to end with another quote, Parker Palmer, he's the author of The Courage to Teach and lots of other inspirational books on teaching. Self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship <clears throat> of the gift I have of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. You, my friends, my colleagues, you are gifts. The work you do is a gift. And so the key, in my opinion, I suggest to thriving through crisis is to begin with caring for yourself. And the rest follows from there. It does not mean to ignore it, but it follows from there and getting okay with living in imperfection. So thank you so much for spending time with me. And I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions if you have any or, or want to jump in and, and ask anything or share any of your own experiences.
Ms. Shira, to, to your question or to this slide here, uh, self-care is never a selfish act. Um, you know, I, I think we all run in, in uh, circles where labor, um, the, the daunting task in front of us being understaffed, um, there's a helplessness there. Um, I, I, know, I know you've talked about culture. Where do you start with that helplessness? We don't feel helpless really because we're in a helping profession. I, I think where I start is with instilling in my leadership team to begin with the importance of taking care of themselves. So my director is off today because she was just worn down and tired. So she's taking the day off today. A really supporting, not working overtime when we can avoid it, not putting in tons of extra hours and prioritizing that, taking care of yourself and realizing there's more room and more space to do that when we support each other than we initially think there is. And I, I think that our our gift um, of, of being, of going into care. So we call it child care. I know we get upset when people call it daycare. Um, I kind of um, oppositionally don't get upset when we call it daycare. Care is a magnificent thing. So we're, we're caring for others all the time. Um, but we, we, we forget to care for ourselves and, and we model for others how they can treat us by how we treat ourselves. So that's been really core and, um, and not blaming ourselves, right? So I, um, from the very beginning of the pandemic, programs would get really proud when they had had no COVID. And we didn't have any cases of COVID until uh, early 2021. But when anyone would ask, there were programs bragging about it. When anyone would ask, everybody in my program was instructed to say, we haven't had a case yet. That doesn't mean we won't five minutes from now. Um, we, I also instructed everybody never to apologize for it. So I, I'm, I'm sorry for the, I'm sorry for the quarantine. COVID's not my fault. I'm not sorry that I'm following regulations of the Department of Health. So I'd explain it honestly, but being really careful not to apologize. It's almost like we're apologizing for existing. We're apologizing for being. We're apologizing for not being able to stop the crises of the world when they're so far beyond us. So that's been another core to, to not feeling helpless, to accepting that um, I can be powerful in the areas that I can control. And the areas that I can't control, it's not helplessness. It's simply accepting a reality that exists. I agree. I agree. That's a beautiful answer. Um, also, you know, you talked about it, uh, the prioritization for forcing not forcing, but for encouraging and um, and facilitating self care is a discipline, right? You know, you you have to be willing to say um, we have we have ratios and we have we have demand. We've had people that haven't been so dependable, but some way as as a, you know as a provider in the business, I've got to figure out a way for coverage because. Um, promoting self-care or uh, ensuring people aren't overworked that is like oxygen and 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 saying you can't do that is is akin to saying well I don't have time to breathe I don't have time to breathe because those things they oxygenate your team uh, and they prevent further damage in the future they prevent employee employee dissatisfaction churn uh, they prevent bigger problems yeah, you know, who are we if we say we're about care for children if we're not modeling that and caring for our staff and caring for ourselves. So if that's what we're about, we have to be about it for ourselves as well. And that means um, being creative with the constraints that are given us. So if, if being creative with the constraints given us means we're open fewer hours or we're accepting fewer children and still giving quality in that time, then that's what we accept as what is right now and living fully in what is right now and giving fully in what is right now and not wishing it were different, working to make it better, of course, um, and not you know having nostalgia for a past that's, that's long gone. 
And sure, I think sometimes having the highest of character is is or or acting in in the interest of the most people or loving loving on your people is sometimes being the 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 cog in the chain or the the link in the chain that just decides to break and and and, and initiate something like shorter days you know going to your parents and saying look this thing all breaks down we are participating uh in the care economy uh, and we have people that we're not taking care of and we've got to do that. So we've got to shorten our hours and or um, we, we have to raise tuition to cover um, a more robust staff and compete in a workforce that's a really impossible right now. That's a really a challenge. Um, but yeah, I think having those, those high character moments um, paired with the right talk track, the right, um, the right kind of emotional message, the emotionally intelligent message to the people we serve. Um, you've got to be willing to be, be the the person that that stands up for your people and sometimes delivers disappointing news, um, sometimes does disappointing things. Absolutely, and as I said before, without apology. So we've done all of that without apology to those that you're giving this message to with kindness, with compassion, with understanding, and without apology to yourself, without thinking you're less than because you're not fully staffed, because you're not fully enrolled, uh, because you're dealing with certain constraints does not mean you're less than. It means you're more than. You're figuring out something that's legitimately hard. You are rocking it. You are thriving through globally challenging times. And once I feel comfortable with the message, and, I, and, and I'm sharing this not about myself, but for you, when you feel comfortable with the message, deliver it with that confidence. Feel that confidence. Breathe into that confidence. So we've done all of the things that Scott has mentioned and more. So we've raised tuition. We've uh, shortened our hours. We've given three more weeks of vacation to teachers and closed and are charging parents for those weeks. Um, and we've done it with pride in the quality of our program and conveyed that, that we're doing this because that's what quality means. And that's increasing the quality of care that your children are receiving. And um, we lost, I think, uh, we lost nobody over the, the tuition increase. We lost nobody over the vacations. We lost, I think, one family who left sadly over the shortened hours and just couldn't work it out with work. And that was okay. So we're, um, we're caring for our people and caring for our kids as best we can and caring for ourselves and realizing that that is a virtue and not something that we have to be sorry for. Absolutely. And Shira, I think educating in all of the frameworks, one of, one of the most enlightening things to me has been growing our business in Australia and talking to some of the historians in the Australian childcare market. Um, and I know people hate it when we compare American problems to problems in the Nordic countries or countries like Australia with one tenth or one, you know, one twentieth of the scale and the issues. But I will say, um, you know, if if you look at the long tail history of the Australian childcare market and the private public partnership and right sizing uh, the labor paradigm and and fighting for the pedagogy of the educators, I think this is something we all need to start educating on right now. Um, so, so everything you can do to equip yourself, become an advocate. Uh, that's why this, this uh, webinar exists. We, we've, we felt like our, our customers were in a place of suffering and, and they needed community and advocacy. And, and so everything we can all do to level up and, and glean knowledge from other systems with different ideas, um, they're well worth it. And, and to that point, Shira, it's always a blessing and, and, and we always say this, um, we, we are so fortunate to have customers like you um, and also partners like you that, that will come and do content for us. Um, this message for me uh, really resonated, really hit my heart. Um, we are 
you know, we, 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 are, we are implementing what we call OKRs. It's objective and objectives and key results. And with your objectives and key results, you're supposed to keep them very simple. Um, for us, we just want to be the best place in the world to work. And we want to be the best place in the world for customers to do business with. So two very simple things. And I repeat those things 10 times a day. Every customer I talk to, every investor I talk to. So um, Sherry, you got me aligned with, with one of those, which is being one of the best places in the world to work. Thank you for the, the tips. Um, and for those of you out there, we love you. We know the last, the last 18, 24 months have been uh, terribly tumultuous and, and just an uphill climb. Um, but we're starting to see some really positive things uh, with the resilience in the early education business, the way you guys have responded. Um, but again, thank you, Shira. We really appreciate it. We're so looking forward to your book. Um, it will be amazing. When it does drop, we will send out an easy order form for, for you. So we'll assume the day it drops, each and every one of you on our mailing list um, will get a, a some, some sort of special expedited way to order it. Um, we're really looking forward to it. So thank you for being here. Uh, we just so appreciate your partnership. Thank you so much. It's always a gift to work with you. So thank you. And thank you, everybody. And, and just to leave with the message of you matter so much and the work you're doing is so vital and so important and you don't get the appreciation that you deserve and you deserve it. Know that and feel that and live that. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. Until next time, take care of yourselves. We'll see you soon.